Welcome, everybody. We're so excited. My name is Andrea Decker, and I have the pleasure of representing the Fleet Science Center, the Science Museum in San Diego. I hope you know about us. If not, I hope you're going to check us out after seeing this wonderful panel. Um, every year at Comic-Con, the Fleet Science Center hosts panel discussions about the intersection of science and pop culture, because there is a lot, whether it is how can Superman fly? Or um, we're looking at science fiction like we're doing to, uh, today uh, because science fiction is only science fiction until science figures it out and then it's not fiction anymore. So we're quite excited to have a wonderful panel. And the reason we're here today is actually um, through the help of Melissa Mella and James Floyd. They have a podcast that's called Star Wars Ologies. And they're leading uh, through our panel today, which is called The Science of Star Wars. Woo all right, Melissa and James, why don't you take it away for us? Thanks, Andrea, and thanks to the fleet for hosting us. Um, as she said, this is the Science of Star Wars panel, and we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to ask all of our guests to introduce themselves, tell us briefly about their expertise in science and in Star Wars, and then maybe what your professional geek out moment is in Star Wars something that really excites you because it's connected to your field. Um, I'll start off with myself. My name is Melissa Miller. I'm uh, trained as a biologist and ecologist, worked as a chemist, now a science communicator. So a lot of overlap, but my favorite thing about Star Wars and what really got me connected professionally is the Porgs from The Last Jedi. Um, did a lot of bird watching as a kid. And so to see the Porgs in their, in their natural environment, there, somewhat bird, somewhat seal was really exciting to me and something that I love seeing, uh, James. Sure. I'm James Floyd. I am uh, the co-host of star Wars ologies along with Melissa. Um, I'm trained as a, a transportation planner, but I, been loving star Wars ever since I was a kid and I am really excited to see all kinds of uh, things happen today. Um, probably one of my biggest geek out moments as a transportation planner is looking at the, the speeder chase on Coruscant uh, in Attack of the Clones um, as they're going through multiple levels and just wondering how do they keep all that traffic directed and you know not crashing into each other. Uh, I'll turn it over to Angela. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm a grad student at a Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I study polar biology um, and just general environments that approach the near limits of life. Um, so, of course, Star Wars is, is fascinating for me. Uh, geek out moment. Of course, uh, I go to Antarctica a lot. And so seeing Hoth, the ice world, um, and knowing that it supports life like the Tauntauns and trying to figure out that little ecosystem um, has always been really cool. But yeah. Great. Thanks. And Lisa? Hi, I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at San Diego City College, and I am the resident astronomer at the Fleet Science Center here in San Diego. And uh, one of my geek out moments actually occurred during Star Wars Rebels, uh, an episode called Path of the Jedi, when our heroes Kanan and Ezra are going to the Jedi Temple on the planet Lothal, and we see Aurora in the sky above them. And suddenly I knew that Lothal has a magnetic field. And I could even tell that its atmosphere isn't the same as the Earth's because the Aurora glowed different colors. So that was kind of cool. Awesome. Okay, Jake. Uh, hi, my name is Jake. I am a concept designer. I worked on all the sequels and the spin-off movies designing uh, aliens, creatures, and droids. Um, uh, and uh, my biggest geek out moment is working on Star Wars. I mean, it was a it was a uh, ambition come true. It's exactly what I wanted to do when I was a thirteen year old, twelve year old kid, and uh, I got to do it. So I'm I finding myself there doing it geeking out big time. And one of the cool things about doing Comic-Con at home is we can bring in guests from all over the world. Uh, Jake is joining us from the UK. Yes. And our final guest is joining us from somewhere in the middle of America. Uh, Jim, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm a geologist and paleontologist. And I actually, um, I have a huge fascination with geology and pop culture and paleontology and pop culture. And so I write um, so for a couple of websites, mostly of mine, uh, anytime I see geology and paleontology in like national parks or in the movies or something, I'll, I'll typically write up about it where the background behind it, or even like wine, I'll write about like, where did the geology and paleontology, paleontology come from a wine label? Um, and that sort of thing. And my, uh, I guess my biggest geek out moment was during the last Jedi, 
uh, I was sitting and um, Gareth Edwards um, kind of licks the ground and says, it's this is salt. And if you notice, the whole planet is basically, other than covered in a thin layer of white, the whole planet is red. And there is a type of salt that is red. And um, as a geologist, you kind of learn a bunch of different minerals. And it's one of the lesser known minerals of sylvite um, that's related to salt. It's a potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And it is a bright red color, similar to what you see on crate. And so that, that, that was my geek out moment. I got so excited when I saw that, that I, I immediately wrote up a whole post for um, AAPT Comics about it. Does it taste the same? It's a little bitter, actually. It's um, so it's it does have that salt tinge to it, but uh, it's definitely a unique taste. I feel like that's the only time we've ever seen science being done, like as a process, because they're like, oh, I looked at this, and what do what are you going to do? You're going to taste it because when I saw in the trailers that red dust getting kicked up by the speeders, I immediately went, I think that's salt. And so I was actually kind of excited <laughs> to see that acknowledged. But the variety of worlds that we see in Star Wars um, and how they're reflected in analogs in our solar system, that is always something I have found really interesting. Um, I don't know if you want me to go on more about that now or if you want to. Yeah, go for it. Uh, one of the criticisms we often hear of the worlds in Star Wars are that like there's too many monoclimates, like the ice world of Hoth or the forest moon of Endor. But in our solar system, we do see monoclimates. We see icy moons like Enceladus of Saturn and Europa of Jupiter, and they do exist um, if they're small enough. And so the problem with them then with people being able to function on them is that when we see monoclimates in our own solar system, the, the, the gravity would be too low. Uh, the likelihood of them being able to sustain an atmosphere. Um, so that's where the difficulties come in. It's not that they can't exist though. So in relation to what you were saying, geologists um, do have a tendency to taste or at least stick on their tongue or their teeth a lot of what they're sampling, just because your tongue and your teeth are so sensitive to things that we 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 like to lick rocks a lot. And and, and it's somebody worked in sniff meteorites because because meteorites smell like metal because they have more iron in them. Wow. Yeah, I was just, just going to say, as as a chemist, we were very specifically told not to taste or smell anything. So same with biology for the most part. You don't want to. Like those microbes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Angela, tell us a little bit about uh, your background photo, maybe, and what exploring uh, life in Antarctica can tell us about uh, life in a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, yeah. So my background photo is uh, is this place at Lake Frixel, uh, which is just a permanently ice covered lake in Antarctica. Um, it's it's gorgeous, um, but also so you know underneath this lake. Uh, ice. We find uh, a bunch of cyanobacteria and whole little ecosystems, micro ecosystems. Um, but yet it surprises me. You know, I'm more surprised with when you find a place that life, you know, can't survive, right? Um, going to all these uh, extreme environments um, and, and seeing how robust life is and all these crazy adaptations um, makes you think really that, you know, can life exist, uh, you know, in, in icy places outside of Earth um, or, or on all these potentially habitable worlds? And, you know, there's good, very good possibilities um, with what we're learning, you know, in extreme places. So I've I've been to Hoth, or rather Fence in Norway, where they they filmed the the Hoth scenes for The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, do you think there's a possibility that the uh, Tauntauns and Wampas really could exist on a planet that doesn't seem to have much in the way of lower food chain items? Right. So that's, I mean, you know, yeah, the, the Tauntauns are, are, are pretty, uh, you know, big complex life uh, for these environments, right? But uh, I like how they related it back. They said that the Tauntauns eat the ice algae, which is really cool to know that there's ice algae, right? Um, so they've, they've kind of related it back to these things. Um, and ice algae support themselves with antifreeze proteins, right? So they, they lower the freezing point um, of ice and they can live in little brines and areas. Uh, whether that's enough to sustain big, uh, you know, mammal-like creatures, who knows? Uh, but, you know, still that, that possibility. Uh, Tauntauns are really special, though, yeah. Did anyone glean any information from when uh, the stomach was cut open? No one froze, froze 
frame and uh, just tried to analyze what they could of those internal organs. We should get a gastro and gastro and I can't say it, a GI specialist <laughs> <laughs> to, to get into the guts of the matter here. <laughs> or a barbecue nice. specialist. <laughs> yeah. That no, was that's... one of my favorite scenes. I love that. Bit. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a memorable one from my childhood as well. And I know that someone has done the science of could you then survive overnight in an animal, you know? Uh, and I think that checks out. Luke would be fine. Han maybe had to get in there with him. We're not sure. Um, he so got in the me. tent. He uh, just, he just put Luke in the tauntaun long enough to put up the tent. Ah, uh, there you yeah. go. It's 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 weird that you know NSF doesn't issue um, standard mammals that you can you know <laughs> tents. What are these tents? Why don't we have? <laughs> oh, eventually the tauntaun would cool off after you know a couple days, and then your tent would be a little more useful. Although if you had a heater for your tent built on the ice, I would think that maybe you'd start to sink as the uh, water mm -hmm. below your tent slowly slowly melted. Yeah, interesting. Could have been a totally different movie. <laughs> so, Angela, I know that you study bacteria and that there's a lot of real life ones that have been discovered that could explain some of the things in Star Wars, um, but that they were discovered after the various movies came out. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of really cool scenes in Star Wars, right? One I always bring back is the Minox, you know, the electricity eating Minox. Um, we don't necessarily find, you know, again, these big complex forms of life that eat electricity, but bacteria, yeah, they do. Um, you know, so right after sometime during or right after that movie, they found these bacteria that get their energy directly from, uh, you know, electricity. They don't need any intermediate substances, just they take up electricity and that provides it with energy. So that that's crazy. Um, but yeah, so much of, uh, you know, so much of our, our, you know, the fascinating things and, and things that could, uh, you know, like that we look at to Star Wars is like, wow, that's really cool. You know, most, most things happen in these little microbes, um, you know, and, and for example, the, the mito or uh, midichlorians, is that what right. it's called? Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that whole theory of endosymbiosis goes back there where, where you have, um, you know, some bacteria that transfers some really cool ability. Um, so, you know, <laughs> will we ever see bacteria that, you know, that can give us properties of the force? Um, maybe not, but, but certainly they, they transfer a lot of cool, um, you know, properties and, and neat adaptations. You were mentioning that they, after the, um, after the movies came out that they found that bacteria similar to um, the binary uh, star systems. I, I'm sure Lisa knows better than I do how they had found um, planets with binary stars um, after the movies had come out because people were kept saying that it wasn't possible until that they were discovered. Yeah. Right. It, and, and now we know there's actually, uh, there's about two dozen confirmed exoplanets now that we know are in binary systems. Wow. Um, and so uh, they're, and they're probably even more common than that. That's just what we've found so far using things like the Kepler data from the Kepler telescope and so on. Is that, is that only information, is that only data and knowledge that you've only found out in the last 40 years then? Because I assume that was just like, People knew that. I thought it was science. We knew there were binary star systems, but the uh, the discovery of, the, uh, of exoplanets, the fact that other solar systems exist have been within yeah. the last couple of decades. So definitely since Star Wars in 77. Okay, cool. We talked about this a little bit with Jim in our Star Wars Ologies episode about you know, the desert planet of Tatooine and is that for this reason or that reason and the presence of water. And then I think we talked for 45 minutes before we realized there's two suns. Maybe it's just hot and the desert is all you get. <laughs> um, so maybe Lisa, do you have more insight into that? Well, uh, the, the two stars in the Tatooine system, that's Tattoo 1 and Tattoo 2, I believe they're, they're called. Uh, they're they're uh, in the Star Wars lore as G stars, which means they are stars like our own sun. And so if you have two of them and you're in close proximity, yeah, it's going to be a little bit warmer uh, than you might expect here. But in binary star systems, there's a variety of options that you can have. And so it looks like Tatooine is fairly close to its stars. So it's just hotter because it's close to two stars like our sun. 
son. But um, there can be all sorts of different things that come in, uh, depending on their distance from the star. You're going to get different levels of solar radiation, uh, especially um, if the two stars are widely different from each other. Um, whether or not the two stars are close to each other or widely spaced from each other is going to determine what sort of orbits you can have and be stable. It's just going to, there's all sorts of possibilities. But Tatooine actually is one of those possibilities. So maybe the, the reason that Jawa's and Tuscan Raiders cover up is because of that extra radiation they're getting from two suns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. the, as the native native creature uh, characters there, they would know it's up more than the humans. So we also don't know the Tatooine's atmosphere because our atmosphere filters out most of our radiation from the sun. So their uh, atmosphere could be differently filtering out their radiation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a new level of overthinking things uh, in terms of how do they all go back and forth between these very different planets and radiation and atmosphere and how do they breathe? But you just got to wave away. And uh, Jake probably uh, wants us not to think too hard about things like that. But I am curious. Uh, no, terms- no, I think it's worth thinking. You know, I think even from you know, as a, even as a you know, watching it, even without working on it, I think even you know, as, as a viewer, I've always thought, you know, I suppose, yeah, it's very handy, isn't it? Everyone can just rock up to any old planet. I think it's sci-fi in general. Star Trek concluded, you can rock up to a planet and it's got the same gravity, a breathable atmosphere. Uh, you're generally okay. I think humans seem to be okay. It's a lot of other aliens which seem to need some kind of like breathing tubes. There's a lot of aliens that we do that have you know they don't seem to be able to breathe the same atmosphere and have little tube and masks but humans are generally fine yeah i think yeah, the it's situation i think the asteroid is really the only time we really see them put yeah. on a breathing yeah. mask and then right. on polis massa at the very end of revenge of the sith where where padme goes to give birth we we actually see an asteroid that has no atmosphere and there you see little spacemen in suits outside, uh, but then they move inside to the uh, the hospital area. Okay. So, Jake, is that a fun thing for you to design the different different adaptations for characters to go back and forth between planets? Uh, yeah, it's always a great addition. It's sort of they always you yeah. come up with multi, multiple cool looking you know tanks and tubes, and it can also be practical if <laughs> you don't have to do a mouth, you know. It doesn't. It, as soon as you cover up, then then you. It's just from a practical point of view. You don't have to do mechanics and animatronics, or it can just make a cool voice, and maybe you've got some lights flashing. Um, so yeah, there are practical uh, advantages as well. Yeah. But yeah, they look cool and are practically useful. And when you design uh, critters, animals um, for different environments, do you factor factor that in as well? You know, the desert planet versus a forest planet. Oh, I don't know. I, I, off the top of my head, I, uh, there are probably things which don't add up. There are probably things you look at and go, "How that? <laughs> that would just, you know, you someone scientific is probably going to blow me out the water." Uh, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, what about yeah. the steel pecker? Well, the steel pecker, yeah, was. I think you see, the steel pecker is kind of adapted to its environment because um, that environment is now a kind of graveyard uh, at, 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 for spaceships. Um, and the steel pecker is adapted to that environment and now consumes the metal, whether it did initially. I don't know. It must, maybe it must have had some. I don't know, but it's now it's now all about you know it's 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 diet is metal and oil and minerals, and so, the seal pecker is uh, the bird one of the birds we see pecking at the wreckage on Jakku in in the Force Awakens. So yeah, there's a brief just, just a reminder of that as 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 um, Ray is I think you, you, very early scene within minutes. I think Ray you, you meet Ray and then she she drives back to the village. Uh, and it, the camera just tracks off this bird, quite a big full frame, and it's there pecking away. Um, I believe Steven Spielberg actually came up with the idea initially and suggested it to JJ that it would be quite cool to have a bird eating metal. That was it. That's the brief. So, um, wow. Yeah. I guess while uh, we're talking, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go on, you say. 
No, I was just going to say, while we were talking about that scene, I know you also uh, designed Ray's speeder and I'm curious about the process that went into that and how much of her character notes, you know, influenced how, how you designed that. Uh, I mean, I know that Ray's speeder, we were fortunate. I, I always would say that, you know, I, I was meant to be doing, you know, our department did creatures and we were, the art department were meant to be doing all the things like vehicles. We didn't normally touch vehicles, but there was a little bit of a crossover and we were given the opportunity to do that uh, because I, I don't know, the, the, the production designers weren't feeling they were kind of getting it. And they were, they said, come on, have a go. Cause we did BB eight and we were doing droids. So it was mechanical. And uh, I think I, again, I was just looking, did I draw on her? I mean, you and you had to carry things, which in the end it didn't really do. There were various other ideas I did that had like areas to carry her salvage and things like that. But I wanted it, I was just finding A, as ever, a cool shape. And it's this big square block. And also I just wanted to look quite um, agricultural. I mean, it is essentially, you put some wheels on it, it would be a tractor. It has a sort of industrial... You know, with four wheels, and it would be a, an old school, you know, those old fashioned 1940s tractors. Um, so there is a sort of in, there's a sort of industrial utilitarian factor to it. Uh, at the same time, it also is influenced a little bit by those 1930s race cars, those long, thin ones. Again, we just put four wheels on it. Um, it's a combination of that. They're a little bit speedier than tractors. It didn't want to look as boringly slow as a tractor. But yeah, it had to just, I just felt it, yeah, it wanted to look a bit sort of utilitarian and useful as is what it was about. Not flashy and, um, you know, I think Luke's kind of got a slightly more of a uh, hot rod, I think, whereas she hasn't. She's got a workhorse. Well, that's a really good way to kind of get their personalities across through their vehicle. Uh, Angela, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, midichlorians at the small end of things. Um, at the, the giant ends of things, there is the gigafauna, the sum of verminoth that we see in Solo in the, the maelstrom around Kessel, uh, the giant space jellyfish squid thing. Uh, how could such a creature like that exist? Right. So I was reading a little bit about their, uh, their diet, right? And and uh, and it said that they rely a lot off of gases, right, for their energy or like charged gases, um, which is cool. And then and then eventually, when they have opportunity, um, probably ships and and other things like that, right. But uh, but yeah, that's already interesting. Again, from our perspective, we we know that um, you know there are a lot of microbes that you know, a lot of things survive off of the sun's energy or for us humans and, and animals, we survive off of eating things, right? But there are microbes that don't need the sun, don't need food, but rely off of gases uh, for their energy. So that, that's already a little cool aspect of that. Um, and then also it seems like, you know, something so gigantic um, probably hibernates a bit, right? So even when they come across it, it's sleeping, <laughs> which is probably something it does often. Uh, and then when they wake it up, it's very grumpy um, and, and finds a nice opportunistic snack, right? So. so moral of the story is if you see something like a sleeping dragon, let, let it, it be. Sleep. Let it sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking about Kessel, uh, Lisa, the, the mock cluster environment that kind of nebula plus that's around Kessel uh, surrounding the planet. Could you have a real planet with a real sun inside something like that? So what's interesting to me about that environment, first of all, it's, it's extremely dense. Uh, you've got large chunks of debris in that system. You have a, a lot of gases and uh, nebulae look uh, dense, to us, but that's because they're so huge. Um, the the densest nebulae in space is still emptier than the best vacuums we create here on Earth. And so that sort of environment, when I look at it, if I'm in my head trying to make it make sense, like what physically could have caused that, that looks like something to me that got destroyed. And so having a planet safely remain within that environment, when something that big around it got destroyed, you know, that's maybe it got bombarded a lot. Um, maybe it's that density that's shielding it from the radiation from the maw 
cluster that's nearby, right? And so there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on there, and that you can that you can try to make sense of. But um, being surrounded by so so much debris, it makes me think that Kessel might get hit a lot. Well, that's probably really bad for the the spice miners there, but uh, probably really good for the mining operations. It's like, hey, we need to open up a new vein. Okay, we'll just wait for something to hit this spot, and then we can just start digging right through the crater. Um, not exactly a precise mining science. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah, so, uh, Jake, you already kind of touched on this, like how animals and technology uh, could be adapted to different worlds. Um, I don't know anything more about some of the other planets that we see that you might just speculate about, or maybe some of the planets that, that you got to work on. Um, like just, I don't know about Porgs since, you know, that's one of Melissa's favorites. Porgs. We do like talk about Porgs. Yeah. I, wanna, I did design the Porgs as well, which is, um, was a, that was good, uh, good fun. Um, uh, very quickly, I mean, I, I have said this several times, the Porgs kind of only existed initially as a kind of uh, a cover-up because the, the island that they shot on in reality was a uh, sort of national, it's a protected wildlife reserve with all these puffins that live there. And you see a lot of those puffins, they're, they're just in, the, in the, a lot of the wide shots, you can see the birds wheeling around. And I think when they were there, they thought they might, you know, catch a few in the background, in the deep background. And I think Ryan's solution to sort of like was to, you know, work with that and and kind of include. He thought it'd be cool to have some. You want to get a? You didn't want to get rid of them. They couldn't physically get rid of them. And then digitally, it was just a bit of a pain. And they thought, well, let's just you know introduce our own wildlife. So he wants to come up with. You know, the brief was, oh, I need something vaguely puff in size, about this big, that we can just plonk anywhere we want in the background and it will then justify the existence of all the other ones that you might see in the wide shots which is i thought quite a, a positive um yeah way of dealing with the problem i think uh and so yeah the brief was to come up with something that was puffin like really and i very quickly it didn't take very long either it did, within about a day i sort of done a various bunch of sketches and he picked the one that, you know, was drawn towards this thing, which I, it was basically a mixture. Initially, it wasn't feathered. I was thinking it was going to be more like a seal and or a penguin, that it would dive a lot more underwater. So that my little sketches had got sort of seal fur and webbed, like skin, uh, I suppose, like a bat or something like that, or a seal, no, like seal flippers or something with, you know, an expanse of skin. I hadn't really got that far. Mm -hmm. It had little flippers or webbed um, fingers, but it would have dived in and, and caught fish. It still, I think, would have done that. In my mind, that's how it hunts. You know, like, um, I can't think of it as a sea, you know, like a, a tern or something, you know, like seagulls mm -hmm. or whatever. But it, would, but it became feathered. And it's this combination of, yeah, it's a mammalian slash bird I mean it's like nothing else it, it's, it's got a slightly dog pug like face and, so can, um, can you uh, <laughs> can you answer a debate whether Chewie plucked the porg or skinned the porg is there a debate I don't know what the word is eating? now <laughs> no, we, would you you'd have to pluck it full stop wouldn't you I don't know I, I'm not a big hunter um the wooden plucking, or can you just catch a bird and, and skin it without plucking it? Is that doable? <laughs> I yeah, I think I think you would have to pluck it. This got very I think plucking. I thought, I thought all birds needed plucking. You don't skin them like rabbits, do you? Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the best. You know, I live in London and I'm not uh, <laughs> not really a hunting, fishing kind of guy. I'm afraid to say, so I can't answer that question. I think he plucked it. Yeah. Well, either way, it did look delicious. I have to admit, as yeah. much as I love pork, Aww. that roasted one looked pretty good. So, can I just go off piece a little bit with the pork business? So, in terms of eating things, in the Mandalorian, there's a shot where I can't remember the name. You know, um, 
What was the little who's Jabba's little? Oh, uh, the Kwakian monkey lizard, Salacious yeah. Crumb from yeah. Return Crumb. of the Jedi. Yeah. So in the Mandalorian, there's a bit where it tracks past a roasting spit roast of a of one of those things. I don't know. To me, I don't have anything to do with the Mandalorian. Is that is that stepping over a line? I certainly thought so when I saw that. Yes. That was really hard because that is a sentient creature. We see it with the Jedi. It understands jokes. It yeah. communicates. And to see the one watching the one being roasted in the Mandalorian was honestly for me pretty horrifying. Yeah. I- <laughs> also, they're kind of bony. Like they don't look tasty. <laughs> no, but it is. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't because, as I say, it's a sentient thing. And suddenly it's like, I don't know. <laughs> well, you think about the Ewoks and, you know, they were going to eat Luke and Han and Chewie and True. They, they didn't even seem like they wanted to shave Chewie first to, to get the fur off. But uh, <laughs> I, I guess they're just going to cook all that hair off. But, you know, I guess different cultures have have different opinions on on eating sentience. Yeah. Well, this took quite a turn. <laughs> Maybe next the Ewoks next year, don't the cooking of Star sentient. Wars. <laughs> what was that, Jim? Maybe the Ewoks don't consider us sentient. Yeah. That's a deeper question. Mm. Maybe. I'm going to take us in a slightly different direction now. Just getting away from the cooking and food uh, direction. I would like to know, so we had a little bit of conversation before we started the recording. Um, Jake, when you design something, you know, you you got to go by a brief and then you probably think about, oh, what would look cool? And you might get your inspiration from the outside world, like a tractor or, or a cool bike you see. And um, so I'd like to learn a little bit about that. But the conversation we had before we started recording was about the science and how science is done, right? Um, so Jay gets his inspiration from saying, oh, man, I know something cool that might work and I'm going to design this based on, on this thing that I've seen. So when you do your science scientists, do you ever watch a movie like Star Wars and you're like, oh my God, this is so cool. We should research this. Does that ever happen? Or do you know of it, maybe? Something like Star Wars as a, is what I think people resonates with the audience about Star Wars and makes it believable is because there's elements in it, I think, which, are t- which draw so much on terrestrial uh, thing things that you recognize whether it's technology or or uh, so, you know, uh, natural history or science um, like say for instance the torn torn so I'm just going to pick, pick that out it's totally believable because it, you sort of think well it looks like something that could exist on this planet it's not it's not the most outlandish uh, insane alien creature ever designed you know you could go nuts and be you know um, and create something that's really alien but it would be very hard for you to sort of take it in. Whereas the Tauntaun just mashes up things that you recognize, like a kangaroo and a, a sheep and puts them all together. And you sort of think, wow, that could exist. And he, yeah, likewise, a lot of the spaceships have a sort of, um, they draw so much on existing technology, uh, but kind of tweak it a little bit that you think, well, you know, it's all believable. So yeah, subconsciously or consciously, we're not necessarily all sitting there going, this is the science we want to apply, but we're all savvy enough about natural history and science and uh, to sort of be influenced and inspired by it. And I think that's ultimately then what you, the audience, us, the audience, I mean, I'm not, I'm the audience as well, enjoy about it and make it sort of think, well, it's totally believable. Yeah, I can see that after one or two David Attenborough nature documentaries, you would have a whole new slew of ideas. (laughs) So, and I remember talking with you separately, Jake, about fish when you had to oh, design God. fish for Acto. <laughs> no, fish, I've said this again before, fish are the worst because fish are just alien. And it, it, not just fish, not fish, but sea life is so alien and they keep coming up with new, you're not coming up, they keep discovering new ones. They'll go down <laughs> some trench and go on to the bottom and they go, oh, wow, we've discovered this amazing little sort of uh, octopus or squid thing and you thought oh that's like nothing you know that is that could be one of these giga you know you blow it up to something you know like one of these giga fauna you've talked about in the kessel run job done you know it'd be um totally believable as an alien so when i've had to design some fish like when luke you know luke's got some fish slung over his shoulder um 
uh, on, in The Last Jedi and I had to design some fish and the caretakers cut some up. And it was just so hard to design something that didn't look like it had been fished out of the sea on a science program already. I even got this the other day. I was watching that octopus teacher documentary. It was even then I was watching that game. Aliens, aliens. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're very hard. I was going to say, we just, we managed to bring it back to eating things with that fish that the caretakers yeah. were cutting. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Andrea, go back. <laughs> I was going to say, Jim, what research was that you've done might have been inspired by Star Wars and pop culture. Any, any of the other scientists want to jump in? Um, I'm not sure anything I've done specifically, but I have um, a, a paper that I wrote did definitely reference uh, Return of the Jedi in a, in a scientific paper. Um, I had done research. Um, a lot of the work I've done is on trace fossils, which are the remains that animals leave behind, um, footprints, uh, burrows, that sort of thing. And I wrote a whole paper on what are called trapping traces, where an animal is not actually catching an item, but leaving a trap or forming a trap that the um, its prey will fall into or be um, like trapped, like a spider web or a what's called an antlion burrow, where an antlion will actually bury itself into the sand and have a kind of like a, a a funnel of sand above it where a small a smaller animal will fall into that pit very similar to um the sarlacc pit on return of the jedi and so the reviewers um one of the reviewers um as any scientists know reviewer number two uh said that i don't need to put that reference there and both my uh, my co-author and i fought back and said no this is like the perfect prime example of to get the this concept out into the the world like what people would understand so you're basically just saying it's a trap yes <laughs> 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 we knew we'd get that one in there somewhere. <laughs> so Lisa, is there something like that uh, in your field? You know, for me, it's interesting. Um, Star Wars has been an influence my whole life. I mean, I saw Star Wars in 1977 in the theater. And so for me, um, seeing that binary sunset, uh, something that was so familiar yet with that additional sun just looking so strange um for me the 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 environments in star wars have always uh asked like can those be real and so things like star wars in affected me at a very young age because it made me start thinking about space in a way like can those things be real and so that's kind of why i chose my major in college <laughs> And Angela, is there, um, I mean, obviously yours has some real, the microbial that you already spoke about, but is there a way that Star Wars influenced you or any of the scientists you work with? Yeah. I mean, you know, so the, the whole premise of it, right. That there are all these different creatures and all these different planets, right. I mean, that's the job of an astrobiologist is try to think of potential, um, potential life and how it's surviving. And so does this help out? Yeah. Totes. Like, you know, when we, when we look at, uh, you know, these creatures we're like, wait, how could, how could that survive? Is there something like that on earth? Yeah. You know? Uh, so it is, it is really cool. Um, you know, even, you know, again, um, you know, the, these concept designers are just intuitive uh, about, uh, you know, what, what might help, um, you know, for example, the exogorth hiding in rock, right. Or, or different little aspects of these creatures. Um, it's always cool to read about and then, and then, you know, try to relate back. Um, cool stuff. Yeah. And I think one of the, the cool creatures that we see in the force awakens, um, is the Lugga beast. It's the cybernetic beast of burden that the, the Tito is riding. Um, do you think that that could work like having the, the head of a creature basically encased. And so it, it can't eat or drink because it's basically kind of got a cybernetic head. Right. Yeah. We'll go back to Jake's um, deep sea comment, right? There are a ton of crazy species down there. Um, so there's a giant tube worm that was found to have no gut, no mouth, right? So how is it eating and what is it doing? Um, but it does have, you know, again, all these uh, endosymbionts that are, you know, absorbing um, hydrogen sulfide and then provide uh, carbon and, and different byproducts for that rift or, or that uh, tube worm to survive off of, right? So, you know, again, little things like that, right? You know, like 
little, little concepts that were like, Oh, does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. That happens. Um, you know, deep sea is another, uh, interesting place there for these, these types of creatures. Everything looks alien, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everything looks alien. Uh, speaking of Jakku, uh, Lisa, you know, you talk about, we talked a little bit about, you know, wreckage and debris from like Kessel coming down, uh, striking Kessel. What about Jakku? Uh, what do you think the impact would be of all those ships dropping out of the sky during the battle of Jakku? And then we see the wreckage in the force awakens, um, you know, the largest ship that the big superstar destroyers may be like 19 kilometers long. We could have a whole another panel on the length of superstar destroyers. But uh, what do you think that the, the impact would be to the planet from those impacts? Exactly right. It's 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 all about the impacts. And um, so to to give an example, uh, the uh, Chicxulub impact uh, that the one that we think precipitated uh, the demise of the dinosaurs, um, that was from an impactor that's about the size of that of the Ravager of that super star destroyer that wow. impacted Jakku. But on the other hand, an asteroid coming in is going to be going a lot faster. And so when you have something of the um, you know, like a super star destroyer, there's going to be some atmospheric drag. It's going to slow down. Um, it's going to have parts break off. And so I think, um, you know, I was trying to think about that, like, what's the speed of them coming in? <laughs> what is the density of the atmosphere on Jakku? <laughs> you know, because all of those things actually would affect how, uh, how much and how intact these objects are and with, with what speed they impact the ground. But Jakku had some craters. I mean, there, there's, there's going to be some craters littering the ground. And I think, um, you know, depending on the speed with which they impacted on a, it's a, it's a cold desert world. No, that's Jeddah, right? Jakku is a yeah. hot desert world. Yeah. I, I keep getting that. <laughs> with the, the soil on the surface. <laughs> That makes a difference. Okay. But with the soil on the surface, I can imagine all those impacts kicking up debris into the atmosphere. And you can even get um, law, uh, climate change on worldwide levels. Um, you know, so it's, like I said, it's hard to know without all the details, but there's a lot of fun ways you can take it uh, with how that would change the environment on Jakku. And I certainly wondered that in the rise of Skywalker too, with the Death Star um, pieces there and those crazy tides that they show is, was it a normal planet before that fell out of the sky? Could something like that have tilted the planet enough to really affect the tides? Maybe Jakku has already been affected, like you're saying with the, the water planet or whatever the, you know, in, in the as far as Skywalker, maybe Jakku is a green and pleasant land and has been blighted by the um, falling wow. spaceships. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, it's a good point. You know, what, what, did you, what, what, what do these battles really do? What do these space battles really do when, when they hit the ground like that? It actually is sort of an interesting because that would have been large scale environmental impact in that case. Um, in the rise of Skywalker, I would still estimate that, um, you know, for tides, you have to have another precipitating body to whose gravitational pull is causing the tides on the world. So there has to be something else around that world in the skies in the rise of Skywalker. What I would think would happen perhaps in that area, if you got chunks of the dead star in your sea right offshore, you have changed the shape of the, of the underpinning shoreline that determines how the tides come in. Um, and so that's, I would think maybe that debris might have helped cause the tides to be a little bit wilder there. It may have also, with uh, depending on how much of the debris of the Death Star um, landed on Kel Kelbir, is that the yeah. name of the moon? Um, shifted the orbit because it's also just a moon of Yavin, and so uh, Endor. It, it, yes, and Endor. I knew that. <laughs> Uh, wrong death right. star <laughs> right. one of the death stars I, there's so many of them i mean really they come so clearly, up with a new name for once so clearly we could talk about this for hours on end but unfortunately it is time to start wrapping up um i want to thank all our panelists for being here i'm going to ask uh the one last question as we go around one more time of what science or technology from star wars do you wish was actually real uh again i'll go first but i admit i couldn't come up with something everything i came up with was more on the technology side holograms jet packs self-driving cars and then i realized those already all exist and i definitely want to explore whether or not those exist because of Star Wars, and now those kids grew up to be the designers of those exact products. Um, James? Oh, um, 
I think one of the this technology that I would love to have exist from Star Wars are droids that uh, I think, you know, R2-D2, BB-8, there's just so much fun to have their their characters unto themselves. Uh, Chopper from uh, Star Wars Rebels. Uh, he, he's a great character. I don't know if I'd want to live with him. I'd be afraid that he'd try and kill me. Um, but yeah, droids. All right, Lisa? Chopper's the best. Um, for me, um, I would just like faster than light travel. And uh, with that, faster than light communication, because uh, if I'm going to fly to a galaxy far, far away, I would like to be able to communicate back to the people that I left behind what I discovered there. Nice. Angela? Carbonite freezing. <laughs> that made me sound evil. Um, it is pretty sweet. They really perfected it. I mean, we have a hard time for like preserving our samples here and, and they've got it down. Um, uh, also interstellar travel. Yes. <laughs> you, you found a, a positive use for carbonite freezing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really, it's, you know, it's efficient. They do a good job. What about you, Jim? I'd have to say, like, when you're looking at the science, especially as a geologist, like we're looking at the planets themselves and there's billions of planets in the solar system. So I'd have to also piggyback on hyperspace travel because that's that's the only way we're going to get to any of them in anybody's lifetime. Right. That's true. Well, uh, I think that's something we talk about on one of our Star Wars episodes with an engineer is, uh, or an electrical engineer is working towards uh, ion engines, right? So one step in the process. What about you, Jake? Uh, re- is it repulsor lifts? The anti-grav stuff, mm-hmm. just like floating cars. Come on. Just no wheels. Let's just get rid of wheels and fly around. How about you, Andrea? Sorry. Yeah, that would be the same for me. I would love to see some hover bikes, um, more hover cars. I think that would be amazing. Not just a hoverboard from Back to the Future. I want the, the full-on vehicle that we can use. Oh, we need a <laughs> Yeah, as as a traffic planner, I just cringe a little bit because then people will just be driving everywhere. And well, yes, you don't need roads everywhere, which would be good, but just yeah, that that there's a lot of chance for <laughs> a lot more accidents and environmental destruction. And mm-hmm. yeah, you just imagine, you know, your average driver, now imagine them trying to navigate in three dimensions. <laughs> Yeah, as okay. someone who lives in Southern California, that is a scary oh, Speed Sorry, of loop speeder level, just floating, nothing too high. I'll be, I'll be happy with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, like I said, we could probably go on for hours, but we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And our panelists, especially, we're recording this over Memorial Day weekend. So thanks for taking time out of your holidays and your various road trips to geek out with us. Uh, you can follow us all on social media, as well as the Fleet Science Center um, and the podcast Star Wars Ologies. That's Star Wars O-L-O-G-I-E-S that James and I host. Uh, Jim and Angela, as I mentioned, have both been guests. Hopefully we'll have Lisa and Jake on at some point soon. And we've got lots of other ideas. And we came up with some more here today about STEM fields um, that intersect with Star Wars. Uh, There's psychology, linguistics, brewing, uh, engineering. There's pretty much uh, no limit to the possibilities. Uh, And make sure when you're in San Diego for Comic-Con next year to visit the Fleet Science Center. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you, everybody. I want to give a big thanks again to James and Melissa who put this together um, for us for the Fleet Science Center this year. They made the connections to the panelists. Uh, they came up with the topic. I just loved it. Thank you so very much. And yeah, I hope for the audience that we showed you that, yeah, pop culture is cool and science fiction is definitely awesome. Um, but real life science um, also is super freaking fascinating and cool. Um, and um, we hope that you had some fun with this. You give science another thought um, as it connects to your everyday life. And yeah, that you visit us when you're in San Diego. We're in beautiful Alboa Park. And stay connected with us on social media. Um, we'll have the links here um, at the end. And thank you, panelists, and uh, Jay, for joining us from London and all your insights on the art process. I really loved it. I thought it was great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, guys. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Thanks, Comic Con.